We chant every day that the Dhamma is open I go. It's translated as pertinent. But pertinent to what? Pertinent to the problems in your own mind. Another way of translating it is something to be brought inward. You take the Dharma inward, you use it as a measuring stick for your own mind. To see where you're still lacking, to see where you're off course, to see what you can learn. And even though the Ajans say that when you listen to a Dharma talk as you're meditating, 90% of your attention should be to the meditation, and only a small percentage to the talk. Still, if the talk is relevant, if it's pertinent to you, take it in. If it's not, let it go by. And one important thing is you don't use it as a measuring stick to measure other people. We're not here to measure each other or to hit each other with a measuring stick. We're here to work on our own minds. And as the Buddha said, for some people the, the practice is pleasant and slow, some, for some it's pleasant and fast. For others it's painful and slow, for others it's painful and fast. So we're not here to compete. We're here to work on our own minds. So if a Dharma teaching is not relevant to where you are right now, just let it go. Stay with the breath. Try to inhabit your body as much as you can with your awareness. There already is an awareness there. But you try to inhabit with your conscious awareness, your full awareness. The awareness that you usually bring to focus on an issue or focus on what you're trying to read or focus on what you're trying to listen to or focus on one spot in the body. And you're trying to bring the same intensity to everything. Now, that doesn't mean to blot out the rest of your body with your eye focus. Just the opposite. You try to let each part of the body have its own awareness, be as full as possible. Try to think of every cell in the body, breathing in, breathing out. and establish yourself in here as much as you can. Work with the breath until everything is at ease in the body, with a sense of fullness, a sense of energy. It's good to start with long breathing to energize the body, because you will be calming it down. And if you start out calm and you make it calmer, sometimes you put yourself to sleep. So try to find the right balance. And as the issues of the breath get lighter and lighter, then you'll be able to see your own mind. That's what we're here for, is to see the mind. We use the breath as bait to get the mind in the present moment. Clear things out in the body so they don't interfere with your ability to observe your mind. And then see what needs to be done. One thing you have to take into account, of course, is the amount of energy you have. Of the five faculties, that's the one you have to start out with. Even though it's not first in the list, the Buddha said, this is the one you use to measure how much you're going to be acting on your conviction, how much you're going to be expecting out of your mindfulness, your concentration and discernment. He gives the image of playing a lute. Back in those days, the lutes probably had five strings. And as you know, in playing with any stringed instrument, you tune one string first, and then you tune the other strings to the first string. So in this case, how much energy do you have? If your energy is low, it's not the day to tell yourself, I'm going to sit here until my flesh and blood dry out, and it won't get up until I achieve unexcelled awakening. You tell yourself, I'm going to get through this as well as I can, with as much mindfulness as I can. And then adjust your conviction, your mindfulness, your concentration, and your discernment to the amount of energy you've got. 
Sometimes you might find that the breath is hard to focus on, in which case you move to goodwill. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. Goodwill for yourself so you don't berate yourself, criticize yourself for the fact that your energy is low. Realizing that we all have our ups and downs. And then goodwill for others. Because there's a tendency when things are not going well in your own mind to focus on the faults of other people. And you can make a detailed list. I'm sure everybody has been analyzed here in the monastery as to what their problems are by other people in the monastery. But why? For what purpose? The Buddha says when you look at other people, it's mainly to see, okay, this is what good behavior looks like, this is what unskillful behavior looks like. And then you turn around and ask yourself, do I have that? If someone has some skills that you don't have, you might tell yourself, well, this is a good time to work on those skills. They can do it, so can I. As for unskillful habits they may have, you ask yourself, do I have those unskillful habits? Often other people's unskillful habits, the ones that drive us crazy, are precisely the ones we have. So we have to look into that. Use other people as a mirror. And as the Buddha said, don't exalt yourself or disparage others. And in the opposite way, other people seem to be doing better in some things than you are. Don't get upset by that. For each of us, the practice has its rhythms. Sometimes the rhythm is slow, sometimes it's faster. And if you go into it with a lot of preconceived notions about how it should be, you end up not really listening to what the mind needs, what the body needs right now. The more sensitive you are to the needs of the body and the needs of the mind right now, the more the practice will be able to grow in a proper way, in a balanced way. And the more you'll learn, if you come in with a lot of preconceived notions, you're not going to learn anything. You just see that this doesn't fit with my preconceived notion and that doesn't fit with my preconceived notion. That's not learning. That's being judgmental. You have to ask yourself, my preconceived notions, are they really worth holding on to? Are they really valid? If you learn how to question your attitudes that way, then you can learn. There's an image that you find it throughout the Buddhist traditions. The teacher pouring tea into a cup and then you just keep pouring and pouring and pouring and the cup overflows. And the message for the student is, okay, you've got to throw out what's in your cup. Then you can receive some good new tea. Otherwise the tea that gets poured in just flows out. So try to be as sensitive as you can, right here, right now. Because you're going to be able to learn things you didn't see before. After all, this is a path to the, for the attaining of the as-yet-unattained, the realization of the as-yet-unrealized, which means you're going to have to do things you haven't done before. And you're not going to know what those things are unless you listen carefully. If it's a Dharma talk, see what there might be new there that you haven't heard before, or what you can learn, relearn of what you have heard before. It's listening to the breath, listening to the mind. It's a matter of figuring out what their needs are, what their strengths are right now, what their weaknesses are right now, and how do you adjust your attitude. So you can grow the plant that you have. The images of a seed that you planted, and it's beginning to grow. 
but it doesn't quite look like the tree that you want or whatever plant you want. And so you push it and pull it and basically shred it because it's not what you thought it should be. This is another image that's very common in the forest tradition. You plant the seed, the, queen, the, <clears throat> the tree knows how to grow if you give it the right things, give it the right conditions. It may be slower than you thought it should be, or may put out a few extra shoots that you didn't expect. But as long as you're putting the right conditions in, in terms of your sensitivity and your in intent, your desire, your persistence, your intent, and your ingenuity, the four qualities that lead to success, the plant's bound to grow, and it'll grow in a healthy way. So remember, we're here to learn, because ordinarily we're causing ourselves suffering and we don't know why. If we knew why, we wouldn't be doing it. So remember, there's the discernment that comes from listening, or for reading, and there's the discernment that comes from thinking things through. And you need both. But there's a discernment that's really going to make a difference. It's the discernment that comes from developing. That means you try to develop mindfulness, you try to develop alertness, ardency, concentration, discernment. In the course of doing those things, you're going to learn things you didn't know before. When the Buddha sets out the factors for the path, it always starts with the right view. But it's not the case that the view is automatically 100% right to begin with. As he explains when he divides the factors of the path into the triple training, the right view and right resolve are the factors of discernment, right speech, right action, right livelihood are the factors of virtue, heightened virtue, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration are the factors for heightened concentration to the heightened mind. But then he, when he lists the order in which they come, which this triple training is, is accomplished, he starts with virtue and then the concentration, and then from the virtue and the concentration you foster discernment. So the message there is that right view can come in with right ideas about meditation, mindfulness, but the actual lessons you're going to learn from actually doing mindfulness and doing concentration may not be what you expect. The major outlines will stay the same, but the details may not be what you expect. So prepare to be surprised as to what insights will work, what insights will come to you ones that actually help you let go of your clinging, let go of your craving. But it requires that you focus your attention inside. Look for your own faults. The faults of others, that's their business. because you're not suffering from their faults. You can make yourself suffer over their faults, but it's the making yourself suffer that's, that's the problem. Because that often turns around and you start making them suffer too. But if you look inside and say, I'm thinking in the wrong way. I'm breathing in the wrong way. And focusing on the wrong perceptions. In other words, look at how you're fabricating things in an unskillful way. Because this is how dependent co-rising gets sent into motion. You're fabricating an ignorance. You're putting together your experience right here, right now. And you're hardly even aware of how you're doing it. But if you bring some knowledge to the process, then the fabrication becomes part of the path.
So look inwards. Listen inwards. Make this your prime focus. And that will solve a lot of problems, both inside and out.